Uh, good morning. For those of you who don't know who I am, my name is Robert Ortega. I am the Director of Member Services here at PSPRS. Um, I've been with Public Safety for over a little over 16 years now, so um, I'm really excited to talk about uh, this next topic here, which is our pension administration system and our updates around that. What we'll be talking about is basically what we've kind of accomplished to this point, um, uh, important milestones that you as employers still need to think about and prepare for because as we transition to this new PAS system, um, there are impacts in terms of operations, policies that have uh, direct impacts to you as employers. So we'll talk a little bit about that uh, as well. Uh, and then finally, I will plan to do a quick uh, si a system feature walkthrough. So it's not going to be a full demo where I'm accessing the system, but kind of wanted to highlight uh, a, a specific function that directly impacts you all, especially if you're on the payroll teams, uh, to kind of talk through what we're building out and how things are going to be looking in that future state. And throughout this presentation, if you do have questions, I, I believe we do have people who are running with mics, so please don't hesitate to reach your hand up and ask the question. So I want to make sure I, I get all the information you all need uh, regarding this. So as I said, we, we're continue our implementation. Um, we're actually in our last year. I'm really excited because this is our final year and we're getting ready to roll and go live with that system, which we're uh, planning for phase one implementation to be uh, started as of a the third quarter of next fiscal year. So around the February, March, April time frame is when we are looking to go live into our new uh, pension administration system. So some of the activities that we've completed up to date, um, we, we are pretty much closing up a lot of the design, configuration, and validation of our core functionality for our internal processing. Right now we're really focused on that back-end type of processing where it's we, we're doing our distributions, our monthly pension payrolls, our monthly service or, or service purchase uh, calculations and processing, our refund processing, and the tax reporting on the back end is, is kind of where we're really focused on right now and the, how it affects our general ledger and imports between that and our general ledger system is kind of where we are in our uh, current state of configuration. Um, we continue, again, we continue our uh, employer and local board service design. Uh, what we're working through in that regard is some of the payment processing, how you would be managing payment processes through uh, the system, how you'd be managing your reporting through the system and so forth. So we're going through that testing and final validations around that. And then we've also concluded our testing of contribution and demographic files for employers. Um, if you have not done that yet, we highly encourage you to reach out to Joanne and Harold uh, to go through that process of testing any of your contribution and demographic files that you'd be utilizing in the system. And then finally, we're going through our final validation and testing of health insurance files. So we began that process around December, January of this year. And so we're still continuing through that validation process, which ultimately we will be working with you all in terms of your testing of files uh, from a health insurance perspective. <clears throat> Um, we also continue to work through, this is the area that I want to talk about here, is really that final design of court fee processing and functionality. And I want to point this out because this is a new area of uh, process for an employer. So for you uh, elected official employers who do report your monthly court fees and pay those monthly court fees, that will be a new process. That will be a new process through our digital self-service for employers self-serve. So we are going through that final testing and configuration um, with regards to that. So I do want to uh, put that out there to, to advise you on, on that particular change. What remains in terms of testing is we plan to go through our UAT testing. That begins in the first quarter of fiscal 25, so it's just a few months around the corner. We're beginning our preparation, our prep, of all the full cycle business processes that we'll be testing within the system, and that will kick off, like I said, in the, in the first quarter of uh, 25. Uh, we then plan to, and this is an area where, again, I'd like to highlight to you all as employers, is we anticipate beginning our training for our employers beginning in the second and third quarter of fiscal 25. So that's like the you know, October, November, December timeframe in which we plan to be begin kicking off that training uh, for our employers so that they're prepped and ready uh, for the go live within our new system. 
And then as I mentioned, our phase one of Go Live is in that third quarter of 25. And at that point is when we kick off our design and configuration of second phase, or what we call rollout two, um, that is slated to go live later that year um, in 25. And that area is really around more of the enhancement of member self-service um, and employer self-service. So things such as a member being able to apply for their retirement automatically through the portals or refunds automatically through the portals and not have to go through a paperwork process. So that's what we plan for in that uh, second phase rollout. So, like I mentioned, through this whole process, there's a lot of changes that will impact you all as employers, and it's important that you take note of some of those changes because obviously it, it will take time for you all to go back and evaluate your current processes as employers on what might change on your end as you interact with PSP. Press, whether it's through that new employee uh, notification, whether it's through contribution reporting, as well as payments. So a couple things that I wanted to point out, which I think we did uh, highlight this last year, but I always just want to emphasize this, is online payments for all invoices. We are really, really pushing that all of our employers utilize online payments ACH payments through our portals. We are gonna be transitioning away, for those who are already doing that, we'll be transitioning away from Wells Fargo eBill and everything will be managed throughout the entire process within the actual portals. Uh, we also will be applying uh, a policy around credits whereby we automatically will be applying credits on a first in, first out basis. So as you report any credits on previous uh, adjustments uh, to previous contributions that create credits, those will automatically be uh, applied on all future payrolls on a first come, first come, first in, first come uh, basis. Where this actually is really important, especially for our fire districts and our, our fire employers, is that uh, fire insurance tax credit. I know a lot of you are very familiar with kind of utilizing that credit on a pay, by, pay period by pay period basis incrementally. Well, what, how that's gonna work is we will download the entire credit amount at the beginning of that fiscal year and that credit will be swept or utilized automatically against all future payrolls at one time rather than a, a proportionate amount each pay period. So that's a, a big thing to think about um, for those particular employers. Uh, paperless, new higher enrollment, and status change reporting. Right now, as you know, we do have uh, demographic reporting for new hires via our portals, but we're taking this a, a, a next step further and doing the entire process online. So I know what you guys do right now is you have the member fill out their membership form, you do the demographic to uh, it, uh, let us know of the hire, and we still get that paper membership form so we can update the member's record with additional you know, beneficiary information or things that you as employers are not reporting on when you're doing that demographic uh, through our current portal. Well, that will be going away. That will no longer require any paper norm, uh, retirement, or not retirement, uh, enrollment forms. Because what will happen is you as employers will take whatever steps we need to get the initial demographic information and then from there, the member themselves can go into the portals and finish up whatever requirements around, around uh, beneficiaries and things of that sort. So we'll no longer be expecting to get uh, membership forms from employers. Online contribution adjustment reporting. I know we did roll this out uh, a few months back, I believe, within our current portal that now allows employers to remit adjustments through uh, the portals. Well, this will definitely be in place uh, through uh, our, our upcoming portals in the future. Um, another major area that I want to highlight is the full enforcement of interest penalties on delinquent contribution reporting. What does that mean? Well, I'm sure as you all may know, under statutes you are required to report and pay your contributions within 10 days of your payroll uh, being processed or your pay date. We are now fully enforcing that from an automated perspective in that when we run our processes, we will identify those employers who are late in reporting and who are late in payment, and we will then create automatic interest uh, invoices that will be paid through the portal to reflect those uh, late reportings. And then finally, paperless uh, retiree reporting and subsidy requests. We will be going through that process online. 
I think I also already talked about the court fees. Um, the other point I'd like to make on this particular area and slide is the annual sweep of outstanding credits at the fiscal year end. So again, automated process. I know right now there's usually a coordination with our accounting and finance team on whether or not you want you know, credits to, to be swept at the end of the year or not, or if you want them to carry over. Well, that's not how we will process in the, in, the, in the future because we need to make sure that our books are fully closed and ready at the end of the fiscal year so that when we report our financial reportings, when we report to the actuary, it's fully reflective of the financial transactions that occurred within that fiscal year. So what will happen is any outstanding credits that you may have on your account at the end of the fiscal year or that pay period for 630 of 20 whatever will automatically be swept if it had not been used on any prior uh, payrolls through that fiscal year. So I'll take a quick pause there for any questions, because now I'm kind of going to go through a quick little demo and walkthrough, hopefully, on one of our functions here. No? Nope. All righty. Well, let's talk about this. So this is going to be uh, highlighting our employer self-service portal. And again, not a full demo, I'm not going to be going online, but rather there's screenshots of what you can anticipate to see. And this is kind of the home screen uh, for our uh, new system, uh, ESS. This is a, it's going to be a, cent it's a centralized portal where you'll process all of your transactions as employers. So things such as reporting your contributions, paying against those invoices, reporting new hires those, and status changes. And then of course, as I mentioned, the upcoming uh, health insurance reporting as well. This portal will allow for either a file import process or manual reporting of those transactions. And so from an import process, I'm hoping that a lot of you who anticipate utilizing contribution files, demographic files for your reporting process, that you've gone through our testing uh, with Joanne and Harold. If not, again, we ask that you reach out to them so we can coordinate any testing, because as we get closer and closer to go live, our ability to really be able to support any testing of files becomes very limited, because we have to now transition into testing and making sure that our system is stable internally. Um, so we'll, we'll be taking a lot of resource to deal with that. So I highly, highly recommend, if you have not reached out to Joanne or Harold, please do so. Uh, and like I said, today I'm just going to focus really quick on a walkthrough of contribution reporting, or what we call in the system work reports, um, and the remittance and payments process. So. If you are a user, you would have gone through that login screen that I showed previously. You would go, obviously you'd be set up and you can go, you can log in. But once you log in, this is kind of that home screen that you'll see. And I, I'm not sure if it looks that great on here, but if not, hopefully you have your download screens you can look at later. But on the left hand side of the banner, you'll see all the different tabs and functions that you would have available, sorry, uh, to you. Uh, as a user. And again, what you see on the left hand side is really going to be tied to your uh, user access. So if you're someone who is really just going to be doing contribution reporting, you may not see all of these tabs here based upon that security level that's been set up for you as a user. But today I'm just going to focus on the, on the three highlighted areas here, which is work reports, uh, the payment screen, and the import process. So the import screen is really going to be where you import all of your type of files. So it's not just contributions, it's your demographic, it's your health file. Whatever files you anticipate to import would be utilized in that import process. So that's where we'll kind of start off there. So once you click on that particular tab, you'll see on the upper uh, right hand side that add import button. So that's basically what you do. You'd be clicking through adding that import you then will get to kind of a wizard type of screen that asks you, okay, what type of file are you importing? So you're going to be selecting the type of file that you're importing. You're going to be selecting uh, the type of uh, other details that is required based upon that file type. And so in this particular situation, we're, up, we're uploading a contribution file. So you're going to be able to put a name to that contribution file that you want to use, as well as identify what pay period uh, you're going to be uh, uploading for. So you can go through a browse uh, process when you go through the browse, and you can 
either click and drag, and I'm not, I didn't show that screen there, but you can do a click and drag or you can search for the file on your drive that you're going to be uploading. Once you upload there, you go through additional wizard steps asking you things such as, is in this situation, is your contribution file uh, separating out that legacy portion or that EPSL contribution? Or is it being combined in your normal uh, uh, defined benefit contributions or that DBCN contribution? You're identifying the pay period that you're reporting for as well as the type. Because again, as I said, you'll be able to do not only your normal payrolls, but any adjustments. So you have to identify in the system what type of file is being imported. You then just validate all of the information you've entered. And once you confirm, the system will then go through a validation process. So there are two different validations as part of the import process. You first have the file structure validation, which is, is your file set up as expected based upon, the based upon the type of file you're looking for. Um, or if, that, if it's past that, then it goes to the next file validation, which is more of the data. You know, if we are expecting contributions on specific people and they're not noted in the file, that's the other validation process that this uh, system will go through. One thing to note is if your file fails at the first level file structure, it stops. So the first moment it identifies a structure failure, that's a hard error and you cannot move any further. So you're not going to get any validations on, on the data because the system can't even do that part. It can't even parse out the data yet. So do be aware of that. And again, we'll go into more detail when we begin the training on that regard. But once all validations are complete, the final release of the file will be completed through the work report tab. So what that means is you validated your file, everything looks good, um, you can then, it's then released to the work reports tab, which we're going to go through next, to the, do the final validations, where that's an area where you can go and do edits, if you need to do edits to information or validation issues that arise, um, and that's all done through the work report tab. And then finally you'll make the payments through the payments tab. So once we go through the uh, work report tab, you'll, you'll now see here that that import that was just uploaded is in an initial status. And so this basically just says everything imported, everything's good, but you might have to do some additional updates uh, before you fully release that file to the system and get invoiced for the payment. Once you get to, uh, when you click on that particular uh, work report, it'll take you to the screen, and again, I didn't put all the screens in there, but the screen behind that is basically the, where you would go to do the editor. So if you wanted to do edits, and I'm not going to walk through that, there's a, there's a function in there which you can edit that report that's been uploaded. But if you think the, the file's good, everything validated, everything's good to go, you then just go and, and release that work report. So it's a submit function. So you'll see at the, that gray area on the back, on the upper right-hand area, is a submit button. That submits, it's going to ask you, yes, do you want to confirm that submit? If so, great. Then you fully have been submitted. Once you've gone through that point, your work report, and again, this is a normal contribution file, has been released, meaning that you're going to now be invoiced, the data is good, and it's now being populated to each individual's member detail on what we call their part account for their contribution history, and now it's a matter of paying against that report. So why do you see two reports here? This is the function of our DB accounts members versus our DC account members because as you know with the DC members you still are, are paying contribution of some sort to PSPRS for the DC disability program, for the DC health subsidy if that member elected to be in the DC health subsidy um, and as well as, as legacy portions are all part of that DC account. So what the system does now is it creates, and I think you see that already in Wells Fargo eBill, you'll see two different invoices. You'll see an invoice for your DC and you'll see an invoice for your DB. Well now that's what you'll see here within the system rather than going to, going to Wells Fargo to see that. You'll see the two separate invoicing um, that you'll be required to pay against. A quick note here that I'd like to point out for our employers who are part 
of the risk pool group, so your tier three membership is part of the risk pool as opposed to uh, the larger, I think larger 13 employers who aren't part of the risk pool for tier three, you'll actually see two additional work reports here because the structure of Velocity, which is our system, puts that group into a different, what we call a different agreement. So they're part of a risk pool agreement, which then ties to this actual invoicing process. So I just want to put a, a quick note there uh, with respect to that risk, uh, risk pool group. So now we're good to go and we're ready to make payments. So how do we do that? Well, first of all, you have to set up your payment. And again, clicking on that uh, benefit or that payment account tab, you'll then go and you'll see a function in which you add your account. So you need to add your ACH account, put all that inf necessary information, uh, routing, account number, et cetera. You validate that, you go through some acknowledgements on the setup of the process. And once you go through that and confirm, you'll see at the very bottom that you have an account set up. One thing that we do, and I'm not sure if we fully are implementing this or not, but as you can see here in this screenshot, this account is in a pre-note process, which means you cannot utilize the account yet. So we would go through a pre-note process by which we'd validate that account with, uh, through our financial institutions to ensure that this is an active account that can be utilized to make payments. And I'm getting a, I'm getting a, a heads up from John and our finance team that that is the case. So you'll see, you'll need to do that ahead of making any initial payments within the system. Once it is active, then you can go through and make the payments. So we're just gonna assume this has gone through and it's active and you're ready to roll. So now what you do is you would be clicking on, if I go back, in this, on the top area where it's blank, what you would see there are all of your open invoices that are available for payment. So what you would do there is you would be clicking on those particular areas to make payments. So you'll see there at the upper right hand corner, make a payment. So you'd click on that. It's then gonna ask you what type of payment are you making? Are you making a payment against existing contribution invoices or are you making a prepaid pre uh, credit payment because again, that will be a new function. I know some of our employers do like to prepay, have a prepay account for their contributions that they want to draw against and this is an area in which they would be able to make those payments as well. So you, you then select which invoices you're gonna be paying against and you'll see there I clicked off the top two from the previous screenshot. Uh, of open invoice, but here you can choose as many open invoices as you want to pay. You can pay them all at one time, you can do a separate transaction by each payroll, however you want to uh, go about making those particular payments. But you do have that ability and flexibility in this, in this system. So once you select your payments, what you're paying against, you validate, you know, again, is this the account you want to use? Because within the system, you can't have multiple accounts. You can set up multiple ACH accounts that you want to utilize to make payments. So if that's the case, here's where you'd be selecting which account you're going to be drawing upon to make that uh, payment on the invoice. Once you confirm all of that, you'll then see here at the bottom that history. So now you'll see that those payments have been made and they show as issued. Um, Obviously, again, we go through our validation to draw the accounts and make sure that the funds are there. Once the funds are there, then what will happen is, I believe this closes, and so you will no longer see that uh, transaction there on the account because it, it's, it's closed. It's been paid, that invoice has been paid. So if you wanna see where that paid invoice is, there is on the, on the left-hand side again, you can see transactions. And again, I didn't pull that up because I was just doing a quick little uh, demo, but you would go to that transactions tab and that's where you would see all those cleared invoices um, that you've paid against. So I'll take a quick moment there and see if there's any initial questions. Got a question right over here. So the question is, will you all as employers still get notifications when an invoice is ready to be paid? And the short answer would be no, only because we go through the Wells Fargo e-bill process. And so as you know, when you report in our portal, it's like a one or two day time frame for us to get that information to Wells Fargo to create the invoice to then pay against. So that's why we have that notification process. Whereas here, it's all one-stop shop. So once you report, 
the invoice is open and ready for you to pay against. So if, if you happen to be an employer who has a function where somebody does just the uploads and somebody else just does the payments, that's again, one of the things you need to think about in terms of processes like I talked about earlier, where you need to think about how does our process work now versus how it's gonna work in the, in the future. So it might require you to create some internal process of notification that payments are ready to be made. But because everything is all centralized, we didn't think that there was a need to put a notification that an invoice is ready to be paid. Sorry, that, that could theoretically be the same person? It then? could, exactly. Okay. And for some smaller employers, it is, so. Another question. So if we're currently paying through the Wells Fargo ePay, wouldn't that automatically qualify that account as a viable account for the new program? You have to get re, to re-enter all your banking information? We would have to have all the employers set up the accounts through the portals because that information sits with Wells Fargo and we're not gonna pull that data as part of data conversion because that's a third party. So we don't have data conversion to bring in employer account information. And so it will be a requirement when we go live that employers reestablish their accounts uh, within the new portal. Correct me if I'm wrong, John, I think. Okay, cool. Any other questions? Got a question over here. Question, question is, where would the credits show up? And yes, that's exactly where, the, where you would see that transaction. You'll see existing credits. Um, and again, how the process would work is once the uh, upload occurs in terms of the file, we have batch processes that automatically sweep and apply those credits to those open invoices. So, and again, I might be getting into the details there, but yes, short answer is you would see what your outstanding credits would be within this portal. Another question back there. How long does the pre-note take? How long does the pre-note take? One day. One day. Thanks, John. Any other questions before I move on? No? Nope. Okay. So, Again, want to re-emphasize, we're still, we may be a year out still, but it's very important that you all as employers stay involved in the process. We host, Joanne and, and Harold hosts, bi-weekly meetings for our point of contacts because when we kicked off this project, we established one point of contact for employer and expected that one point of contact to share information with all stakeholders because it would be very difficult to interact with 300 employers who have 17 different people who are impacted by these processes. So we want one point of contact to kind of share internally with each employer. But having that person participate is important. And that person who is participating, if you are the point of contact, ensuring you're sharing that information with your internal st stakeholders who are involved in the process. Um, so that's one thing we wanna talk about. Uh, ensuring that you take any actions uh, when, when addressed. So again, when we went through our process of file testing, which is right here, we're talking about health insurance file testing, making sure you've gone through that uh, testing. If you haven't, I can't stress enough, please reach out to Joanne and Harold. So what remains left in terms of true action items for employers is really the health file testing. Uh, if you are an employer who plans to utilize health insurance file testing, we uh, presented those file specs back in July of last year. Um, we are still going through our internal testing ourselves, but we anticipate beginning employer testing <clears throat> here in May and June. So if you have not yet begun that development process with your internal or third party vendors uh, to get that file uh, structure ready, and you anticipate utilizing this file, I highly recommend you get that started. And if you have questions, reach out to Joanne and Harold uh, so they can help you with that in, in preparation of our testing that begins upcoming here in May. Um, as I mentioned, the, we, may have, we may have concluded our demographic and contribution file testing, but that's not to say that we still can't do that. We wanna make sure, we wanna be good partners, we wanna make sure that when we go live, it's as seamless of a process for you all. So if you have not yet done that testing, please still reach out to Joanne and Harold. We'll make every concerted effort to get that tested for you all. But as we get closer and closer to go live, our ability to support that becomes less and less as we have to ensure our testing and the st stability of the system at go live. 
Um, outside of that, I think that's pretty much all that I have here in terms of updates. Um, again, Joanne and Harold are your point of contacts for this project if you do have any questions regarding anything. Um, but I'll take a qu another quick pause here for any last questions. Otherwise, I am done. No? Awesome. Thank you. So I think I'd like to introduce next Trustee Wonderly. I believe we, uh, he will be talking a little bit about our DC plan. So I'll hand it over to Trustee Wonderly.